forgot to have him on board. So, Ron, if you'd like to take it away, let's talk about perimeter protection. All right, great, thank you. Um, I just uh, I like to start uh, all these talks with some expectation management. As Maureen said, I am uh, talking from Abu Dhabi, so uh, bear with me if there's any internet issues. Um, we're this uh, presentation is basically just going to give uh, highlights of some different technologies. Um, it's meant as uh, an overview and and kind of uh, just kind of a work through on on what goes into perimeter detection systems is something that uh, I found over the years that not everyone uh, specializes in. So we'll, we'll uh, work through there. Um, some of the components of, of a great system are, are ensuring that you have a layered intrusion uh, detection sensors. Uh, Great assessment cameras, which are different than general surveillance cameras. A command and control platform uh, that gives you kind of the quickest uh, response and assessment time possible. And and then you have to ensure you have some response capabilities. Uh, one of the things that uh, we kind of go through on the silver bullet uh, theme is there's no uh, there's no one technology that's the same. I, I ask this question a lot is uh, which one would you pick in the you know to win a race and everybody tends to go towards the sports car and the fact is if you're racing in say the Baja 500 um, it's a little bit different application. The sports car is not going to do much good for you. So, um, so we you have to look at uh, what every application requires some different tools. We have um, a lot of different uh, technologies here or, or systems that kind of require um, different fits for the sensor technology. We have waterfront surveillance, um, generally some wide area type coverage. You want to use maybe some radar, longer range cameras. Um, you have substation kind of uh, systems that are unmanned, typically lower bandwidth uh, type applications. So they, you know, go for um, closer intrusion detection type things with uh, more surveillance uh, applications. You, you definitely have uh, your higher security applications with some double fence lines and and multiple layered systems. You can get into um, some offshore type things. Again, looking at some radar um, where you need uh, longer range surveillance and more. You don't have as much delay, so you need to uh, have as long a re uh, alarm as possible. And then some low, you know, low light environments. And in the case of some of the prisons now, it's it's not only detecting if someone's trying to leave the prison, but um, with contraband interdiction and trying to see who's approaching the fence to throw stuff over. Um, so each of these applications require some different technologies, and and some work better than others um, for you know dependent on the application. Some of the factors that go into a good perimeter system. Um, one is what's necessary uh, for the job that you're doing. Um, this usually comes down to what the threat is, um, what the chances of that threat um, hitting your facility, you know, the risk side, um, what your operations uh, entail. It doesn't do very much good if there's a a full-blown security system that the plant can't operate or the, the facility can't operate properly. And, you know, as we all know, what happens, uh, how much budget you have available to put towards a solution. Um, generally, when I'm looking at these systems and trying to do some designs, there's uh, several factors that come into play. 
the size and shape of the facility, what the terrain looks like. In this case, you know, if there's what, some wide area available, um, maybe not to have to install so much infrastructure, go with um, a sensor device that that uh, covers a, a wider span and, um, and then use longer range cameras in that uh, configuration. Whether you have line of sight in those kinds of uh, settings, uh, if it's a tight environment, you're going to have to look at some different uh, technologies to cover um, a closer range. Uh, the, your temperature has a lot to do with, with uh, what technologies you use and, and again, what the environment is, fog, heavy snow, um, whether there's snow piles up in certain areas, uh, rain, those kinds of things. And, um, and then you have your operation uh, considerations. Again, what the uh, work hours look like. Uh, is it a heavy traffic area around the facility or is it uh, an isolated facility? Are you under any kinds of regulations? Um, or do you have safety issues such as uh, explosive uh, um, issues? So like class one, div two. Every application requires some different tools. Mostly um, what I've found is the, the higher the security level, the more layers you, you're going to want to put um, around the asset to protect the asset. And um, this is mostly because not one of these sensors has 100% probability of detection. Um, each one has strengths and weaknesses. And when you layer uh, complementary systems, you can kind of balance out what the strengths and weaknesses are for each technology. And that's what we're looking at doing um, from the lower risk sides may, may only take a couple layers to the high risk sides um, taking several layers. Please uh, jump in at any time you guys uh, happen to have any questions to Some of the basic types of uh, perimeter detection, detection systems or sensors out there, um, two basic variations, linear type devices and volumetric. Um, each one has, again, some benefits and drawbacks. And uh, we'll go through in the next few slides and kind of talk more to each, each type of device. The linear sensors, basically um, ones that are put directly on a uh, on a barrier and to detect um, if that barrier is mostly being climbed or, or cut. Usually that barrier is a uh, fence type device, but it, um, there's technologies that can go on uh, walls or or other um, areas underground and um, that can be mounted and, and accomplish the same goals. So usually these areas in the gen are more general surveillance, uh, lower risk if they're used in a single layer, or if it's a higher uh, security application, they're um, used as a, a layer in a multi-layered system. And um, one of the benefits to these is that um, they can, they require limited infrastructure uh, in, in a lot of cases. So. so some of the pros of of a linear type system, they're cost effective. They don't have a very big footprint because they're on, on the uh, perimeter directly. So if there's a sidewalk or public access that's on your, your fence line and you don't have the availability to, to monitor um, a, a large distance off of your fence line. This makes a, for a good first layer um, system. And then try to use some volumetric inside the fence line if you can uh, to create a second layer. Again, limited 
infrastructure requirements. And um, these generally have the ability to, to um, cover longer distances when you talk about uh, fiber optic technologies and, and that um, all the way down to, you know, some of the um, more analog systems in the copper uh, side of things and um, for, for smaller sites um, are very good too. So some of the comments. Hey Ron, Ron can, I, yes. can I interrupt you for a moment? I have a question coming in. Sure. Somebody's asking, is this a capacitance-based technology? A capacitance. Well, I'm, I'm kind of I'm talking uh, some general, um, again, just generally about what the linear systems are. We can go into um, some of the, the next slides. We'll talk a little bit more detail about uh, the types of of systems in there. Again, I'm, it, this is a very uh, kind of 30,000 foot level overview of, of some different systems and and some benefits and and um, of of layering the systems and and what to look for when you're putting a system together. Okay, so so we can continue with what you're doing, and um, Ron, who asked the question, we'll get back to you, and we can talk about that later in a little bit more more detail if, if we go off uh, if if we don't get your answer here. Thanks. Some of the cons of of the system, they're relatively easy to to defeat in in bypass mode. If you have a um, six-foot fence with a thing over the fence without touching it, you're not going to create an alarm in that situation. And um, and so again, these are some of the things that you factors you would consider in layering a, a volumetric uh, sensor be behind the fence. Um, so that if someone did clear the fence, they would be picked up on a second layer. Um, some of the other considerations are um, when they're when these systems are configured in longer zones, they have shorter response times. So you're going to have to um, get a camera on the system for your assessment capability pretty quickly. We get into some examples of uh, of of different types of linear detection. Um, fiber optic have the ability to um, go long distances. It doesn't require power out on the fence line. Um, it's resistant to RF noise and and uh, so it's. It's uh, safe from an environmental standpoint. It allows for um, some signal processing, so you can start to filter out um, some of the nuisance activities that, that have been known to happen with these type of, uh, of systems. For instance, uh, wind and high vibration. Some of the fiber systems out there have the availability to recognize um, what that signal looks like and, and start to filter some of that out. You have taunt wire systems. Um, generally put into areas with uh, higher levels of of uh, security. They're a little bit higher uh, maintenance installation wise, um, but very uh, secure, have a very high probability of detection. You have uh, electric fences, and these aren't generally um, the shocking kind. They're, they're more of a system that, um, you know, uses the fence as, as a means of uh, creating a field. And when the fence is grounded, it's going to create an alarm type situation. Um, 3D MEMS is a um, accelerometer that's uh, used on the fence. It's it's more of a sensor type, looking for vibrations on the fence. Um, 
the 3D side is a combination of several uh, units, and and they're connected um, via copper cable usually, and and um, look for again different signal vibrations on the fence. Um, these systems can be um, pretty accurate in in where the alarm activity comes in, and and so you can generally you can drive a camera, um, say to a very close location on this type of system, um, and then a system that generally not you know considered this, but active infrared beams, um, you know along the inside of the fence or on the post um, are in the linear mode because they're fairly small volume and they're looking for uh, sections to be crossed in order to create the alarm. Some of the activity or uh, the other side of the system or basic types are volumetric intrusion sensors. These are generally looking for um, movement in an area around the asset, so um, in a in an alarm area, they're excellent tools for early warning systems. The, if you have the space available, it's better to pick an alarm up and start to track and um, set the alarm before they reach your perimeter than it is after. So. Um, if they've reached your perimeter and you've set the alarm up, you're responding as they're going closer to your asset and it decreases your response time. So, um, generally, volumetric detection is more difficult to uh, defeat um, just because it's a larger space. It's, it's harder to bypass um, these types of systems. Some of the pros, they can be cost effective if, if designed properly. You can cover uh, larger spaces without a lot of infrastructure cost. Um, you can have overlapping spaces, but you, you basically can go anywhere from wiring a single site and covering a couple of kilometers um, to, you know, uh, to systems that can cover say a football field worth of area with a, a single radar head and and camera. So early they give you early warning as I discussed earlier. The, so if you're if you're picking up an alarm before they hit your fence, you've already can initiate some response and have a better chance of of um, stopping an attack before it hits your asset. Uh, one of the other big benefits is with these uh, types of uh, um, sensors, they can generally do geospatial uh, type of settings so they can reference uh, where they are. This uh, plays in well to the command and control aspect. to a space on a, on a mapping system you know what, Ron, automation with your system you for a sec. that a zoned type of environment doesn't uh, lead, lend itself well to. Uh, some of the cons are that it does require, for, for it to work well, it requires some space. So you either have, in some cases, an isolation zone or in other places, uh, some distance off your perimeter where you don't expect a lot of activity to happen and, and um, you can start to monitor um, those areas. But uh, the more space you have available away from your asset, the, the better some of these systems can work for you. Some of the types of systems that we're talking about here, uh, microwave, microwave can come in um, Bi-static and monostatic. A bi-static system is a transmitter-receiver type head, um, generally creating a, 
a football sized uh, RF shape between the transmitter and receiver. Um, can range in short distance out to a few hundred meters generally. Monostatic systems are a transceiver type of environment, a um, little wider uh, bandwidth, um, but shorter range typically. Um, they both have their, their uh, benefits depending on what that application is. Um, they also have a couple of uh, different types of one is an older type system zoned um, where you're in analog mode and you're breaking a beam and whatever the distance between that transmitter and receiver is is what your alarm zone is. Um, some of the digital side of things allows you to um, do some signal processing a little cleaner um, because there's some better intelligence in the, the componentry. It also allows you to do fine tuning of of uh, the heads in different environments. Um, passive infrared detectors are in in the volumetric side. They're generally a a, a transmitted uh, distance. They're looking at uh, shorter ranges typically, and um, this is again in an outdoor mode, but but many people know them as what uh, opens doors and on the inside and, and uh, typical alarm set on the inside. The outdoor versions are a little higher. Capability generally um, are looking at uh, a few zones within the alarm area and, and can do some basic uh, size and motion determinations with them. They're typically matched up with a fixed camera and that fixed camera uh, is directly tied to the the uh, zone alarm so that when it goes off the camera can immediately put a picture on the, the screen of what the alarm looks like. These systems are typically put in a chasing pattern around a uh, fence line and um, requires some infrastructure, but they're they're not they're fairly uh, mid range on the expense side. Um, they're they're a mid level type of uh, security platform. So, video analytics. Um, there's this is a term that gets used quite a bit. Um, there's the technology has been improving over the years. Um, there's many algorithms now that do different rules. Um, there's companies that um, can do fairly small um, pixel on target type of algorithms. Um, I, I would say this with analytics, if you're looking at systems um, and you've had bad experiences in the visual spectrum in the past, Look at thermal. Um, thermal imagery is coming down in cost, and it uh, does quite a bit for filtering out uh, a lot of the environmental alarms that, that would occur in the past with different systems. Um, so there's, there's many companies out there. You can go from companies that do everything um, integrated with the imager itself to companies that do server-based analytics, um, to other you know companies that do basic motion and and um, on an edge device type of uh, platform. So uh, again, each one of these different type systems have their advantages and disadvantages in the system, and, and it comes down to what that application is, how long the zones are, what the environment looks like. Um, if you're if you're looking to do uh, slew to queue type tracking, you need some more advanced type systems. Um, but it's a it's a viable uh, solution. One of the big benefits is when it's used, typically the alarm comes in, and your assessment, your initial assessment capabilities are right there because the imager is what's creating the alarm. So um, that's a huge advantage on the response side. On radar, 
there's a, a lot of different uh, types of radar. Radar has been coming into play um, on the commercial end of the business for probably about the last six years. Um, you know, it was primarily a defense type of, of uh, industry uh, sensor, but the cost is, has been steadily uh, coming down. There are some systems that will cover a football field for in the list price range of, say, $14,000 for the sensor now, which when you're talking that area and you don't have to do a lot of infrastructure is a big cost savings. So um, those are some benefits if the space is available. They are reliant on having line of sight. They don't go through through buildings and things, so they're, they're designed for covering open areas. Um, but they do have the capability of, of setting uh, specific alarm areas within the coverage point, and they do filtering on some target sizes and what the vectors look like. Um, so there's some some advantages to it. Uh, radar also is a very good um, sensor technology for going through most um, environmental conditions. That wavelength is very good at at going through things that uh, visual spectrum cameras and and other uh, sensors have an issue with. Um, so the two basic types of radars are uh, searing arrays and um, scanning radars. Um, you have a couple of different technologies in there. Um, um, with pulse Doppler systems and also with FMCW. And when looking at these systems, kind of make sure they're uh, designed for surveillance applications. Um, there's, that's a specific mode. Usually it's designed to um, give good input into a command control center. Um, again, these systems are designed, uh, they'll give you alarm activity, but they don't give you uh, very good assessment cap, uh, capabilities, so you always have to team them with a good assessment product. And um, when doing this, the longer the range is, the longer your assessment camera capabilities have to be. So it doesn't help to have a long range sensor if you can't uh, assess the camera or assess the alarm within that long range. So another volumetric. Uh, device that's commonly used is a buried cable. Um, this one is uh, very good for applications where you don't want to see the sensor. Um, so kind of estate coverage or, or areas where having some covert uh, detection capabilities is, is necessary. Um, it's a, it's a, Good technology. It has a high probability of detection, and uh, it is dependent, though, on on certain environments. It um, it doesn't like a lot of standing running water in the area, so it needs to be dry. Um, again, it's a consideration if you're looking at some areas that you need some covert type coverage. Now we get into the assessment camera process. Um, the most important part of this is you can have all, all, the best probability of detection in the world with your sensor capability. If you don't have a good means of assessing or validating the alarm, it does your, your system no good. So um, ensuring that your camera is lensed properly, that it can see 24-7, um, that it can see in the environment that you need it to see. Um, some examples in lighting, inconsistent lighting uh, situations, um, like you see on the left, having a capability of doing kind of dual technology, day-night camera uh, during the day, getting visible spectrum. And when you have low light issues or you have gleaming lights in your scene, to be able to switch to thermal. Um, again, these costs of these systems are coming um, down drastically and becoming more affordable. 
and and they're important when you're putting these systems together that you can assess the alarm activity 24/7 whenever you, you need it. So the picture on the right here kind of demonstrates um, some benefits of using thermal and uh, capabilities over visual spectrum in some cases. If you're looking at a substation with, with wooded areas around the substation and, and you're getting alarm activity, um, being able to, to see or detect heat is, is an important feature set. Some of the common mistakes I've found over the years with uh, with what happens with these alarms, um, setting a sensor up that's on too long of a zone, having and having a uh, assessment camera try to do too many things with that alarm area. If you can't get the uh, PTZ around, PTZ cameras are are great technologies, um, but they have there are limitations. They can only see in one direction at a time. So if you're creating an environment that that camera needs to be looking at several things, um, you're going to miss alarm activity. Sometimes it's better for higher situations to put a fixed camera in on an alarm zone and know that you're getting that uh, assessment capability every time the alarm comes in rather than relying on a PTZ even though it looks more cost effective. If, again, if you're not getting the job done, it's not cost effective, you're, you're losing your system. Um, and then not factoring in environmental conditions. Um, some of the, the inconsistencies with, uh, with the cameras tend to be with, I'm gonna switch back around here, but um, simple things like, Using uh, dome cameras as opposed to a camera that has the ability to uh, go 90 degrees plus or minus or have absolute positioning, um, have as something as easy as a wiper blade. Um, it's many times I've gone around in, in industrial applications, seen um, brand new dome cameras three weeks into the job with with uh, Dirty dome covers. So it, again, it doesn't matter if the camera's the best in the world. If you can't see through the the lens cover because of the environment, it it doesn't do you any good. So, looking at those issues and ensuring that you have a capability to, to do cleaning of the lens, housing, those kinds of things are important when you know when doing the system design. Ensuring if you're going to do salute to queue type applications that you have absolute positioning available is also important. Um, a lot of differences between the functions of the assessment camera and the general surveillance camera. Um, kind of went through some of these, but um, you're, you're really concentrating on lensing a camera to look at the exact zone that that you have set for your alarm capability. That's the most important thing. Having a, a wide field of view and not being able to see at the end of the zone from an operator standpoint does not help in the assessment of the camera. What it does do is increase the probability that you're going to uh, turn that that sensor off or the operator is going to turn the sensor off because he's going to think there's a lot of nuisance activity out there. Many times that nuisance activity is actual alarm that isn't being assessed properly because the camera's not fitted right. Some of the other considerations to think about um, in, in, in a harsh environment, whether it's a class one Div two type environment that you you need to see. Sometimes it's better to make the investment in the in the better piece of equipment than to try to move the camera outside of that area and, and lose lensing potential. Other times you you have that availability, but know that um, that you have um, the availability for class one div two 
um, housings, and and again, those costs are are becoming more manageable. They they weren't in the past, and they're they're becoming better. Um, also, using ha the right housing in in different environments, corrosive, uh, salty environments, stainless steel, um, some of the, the polymer uh, type housings. Now, um, think about that the life cycle of of the systems. Um, Lighting during your worst conditions. Sometimes uh, you'll you'll find that you have enough lux in certain areas, and in the winter time or during a storm, those conditions go down, and you you don't have that capability anymore. Now, changing up the technology again, going to something that maybe gives you dual dual capability on the thermal and the day night is uh, is beneficial in those cases. Some of the images below kind of demonstrate um, the, the the different types available. Um, visible lights can, can can go from a you know a, a hundred meters out to I've seen some go out to five or six uh, hundred meters um, on the higher end systems. Uh, some of those capabilities, they definitely, the benefit there is when a light's put on on you um, during an alarm capability, you know you've been uh, tagged and it's a good deterrent. So in some of the lower level stuff, it not only becomes an assessment tool, but it also becomes a response tool and, and may drive your your threat away. Um, the thermal capability is is a very good tool. Uh, for seeing through many of the environmental issues that are out there. Um, it also, because of the spectrum, um, does a good dynamic range type of coverage. So if you have hot and cold spots, it's going to give you um, some consistency in in, um, in what you're seeing. One of the drawbacks is it doesn't give you a ton of detail on um, capabilities where the visible spectrum does. So, and then infrared, it's a it's an active uh, type system. It it does have some uh, distance uh, limitations, but it's a a good tool for out to a couple hundred meters generally. And um, and again, it's a good medium tool. They do tend to require um, more power than say a thermal type camera. So if power is one of your limitations on the job, uh, take a look at the, the thermal aspect over the infrared aspect, even though the, the camera may seem uh, less expensive, um, you could be saving money in your infrastructure costs. Some of uh, video tech's assessment cameras and I've been using these guys uh, in various aspects for probably six years now. Um, one one of the things I, I've always liked is the integrated wiper blade. Um, again, I know it sounds like a more trivial uh, feature set on, on a camera, but um, I found many times in the environments that I've worked in, chemical sites, utilities, that uh, the environments are prone to 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 dirt and wind uh, conditions and and those lenses get dirty and and no matter what your maintenance plan is it's uh, difficult to keep cameras at tops of poles clean so um, having the wiper capability is is a big benefit there um, each one of the cameras has uh, some capability that we just discussed before you have visible uh, light feature sets, you have uh, an integrated IR system, which is uh, was pretty unique on, in the industry on, on that side. This one um, has a capability of going out a few hundred meters on um, with, with uh, some pretty intense beams. And then you have uh, your dual camera capability with the thermal and um, visible spectrum in a fairly small body setup. So 
They also have your clay class one, div two, and corrosive uh, harsh environment uh, platform, and the Maximus. So um, I've used all of them. They they all work very well. The Onvif uh, um, protocols, you know, make it pretty easy to integrate them with different systems. Um, so they've been they've been great for me that way. The one of the following uh, feature sets is uh, command and control platforms. I, I kind of um, sticking on the system uh, on the PSM side of things here, more digital um, way to go. This is the more up to date uh, version, and there's a lot of different uh, um, variations of PSM. Um, but the important piece in, um, in general terms is making sure that you're taking advantage of a common operating picture so that your operator can kind of see the whole facility, see what the alarm activity is, and have a holistic uh, view of, of approaching the alarms and responding to activities as they occur. Um, this is a big advantage uh, for uh, perimeter intrusion detection system. And finally, on the response side, um, responses is, is relevant to what you're protecting. Um, you can go from a technology type solution, as you see in the lower left, with a audible type uh, alarm capability, where you're from an operator remote operation standpoint, telling the person, you know, you in the blue shirt, you're on private property, get off, to being able to turn a high-pitched uh, sound on that person in a very concentrated mode and be there, um, all the way to higher-end platforms, and which I'm kind of familiar with now is, uh, you know, armed response on-site um, to being able to, on substations uh, type environments, call law enforcement and and have law enforcement response and as a tribute to uh the UAE I decided to put the uh patrol car from Dubai in 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 as this example here so um, keep in mind when you're doing a remote re uh law enforcement response even with this particular patrol car you have uh some time restraints in place so you're going to have to look at um, ensuring that you have enough delay to your asset um, for that response mechanism to kick in. So I think that's it for the presentation. I'm sorry it ran a little longer than we anticipated, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if there's any out there. So. That's great, Ron. Um, that uh, that patrol car in Dubai <laughs> is what I would expect for a patrol car in Dubai. So thank you. I think we have um, we, we have not lost anybody. <laughs> Everyone stuck around, so I appreciate everybody for staying with us as we went a little past 1:30. I've been getting some great comments. I will pass along to you when we're done, Ron. But I, I think that covers it. If anybody has questions, definitely email either Ron or myself. Again, I want to thank you for attending this Wednesday web event, the last of our summertime series. And as we are planning our next series, I want to hear from you. I want to hear what you're interested in learning about. Do you want to learn more about product? Do you want to learn about applications? Should we bring in some more guest speakers like Ron? This definitely drew a lot of attention. Um, we, you know, we want to we want to gear this toward you and and your needs. So definitely let me know. And I thank you, Ron, for joining us. I think with the eight or nine hour difference we have here, you can finally wrap up your work day and go to sleep. So for the rest of you, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And we will see you for our next series. Ciao.